Vicky, she 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 wanted to kill me first start. Oh my out. gosh! When we first started started hunting together, and he we, we were hunting on a on a farm that had raised cattle that they raised cattle. So the one day we go out there just do a little scouting, and he picks up these cow pies, and I'm like, dry. They were dry. They, yeah, <laughs> and he stuck them in a bucket of like a five gallon bucket of water yeah. and dissolved them, and then filled up the spray bottle. And when we went hunting, he sprayed me down with that. Uh-huh. And you, you're like, I've got, yeah, he's a <laughs> and keeper. And what happened? Right. What'd you have? Huh? You had deer all around you. Yeah, and I smelled like it's all right. doo-doo. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 252. Ralph and Vicki Seance Rillo, Archer's Choice. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Hunter's Blend Coffee, imported directly from family farms, roasted and brought to you by hunters who support the hunting industry. Polar Works Coolers and the Chill Zone, specializing in the most durable, reliable thermal cups and coolers. Keep your drinks hot or cold in any element. Covert Scouting Cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. And Big Buck Merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies. And show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, my name is Joe Donito. I'm one of the Adirondack trackers at adktrackers.com. You're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry. This is John Eberhardt. I've been hunting out of a saddle since 1981. I'm about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry, deer hunting podcast. This is Laura Zara from Naked and Afraid, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. If you've ever watched hunting television, you're probably familiar with Ralph and Vicky Seance Rillo and their show Archer's Choice. This year in August, Ralph and Vicky will air their 400th episode on the Outdoor Channel. From Ralph's archery shop that he ran in the 1980s, grew the television show. And together, they were the first couple to produce outdoor television. They've hunted five continents, 11 countries, 10 Canadian provinces, 27 states, and have taken over 50 species of game. They travel frequently and hunt frequently, so we figured they learned a thing or two about hunting strategies over the years. So we asked them to share, and they agreed without hesitation. We'll turn to our entire interview with Ralph and Vicky in just one moment. But before we do, let's hear from our friends at Polar Works Coolers. And Jim Keller with the Deer News. Folks, I want to tell you about one of the best coolers I've found for the price in quite a while. I was with my family the other day, and I couldn't believe the price on the cooler I was looking at. I always wanted one of those high-end coolers because of the quality that I had heard of, but I couldn't justify the price. Then I found Polar Works. Finally, I found a company that understands quality and affordability. The Polar Works lineup is extensive and is filled with polar cups, polar tubs, and polar soft coolers. What do I love about these coolers? Well, for one, the ice stays frozen for a long, long period of time. But they've thought of other things in their design. For example, drain speed. No one likes a slow drain after a long weekend on the trail. The Polar Lock System. 
You're always protecting your valuable beverages from thirsty outsiders. And there's the non-slip polar feet. Polar feet will prevent sudden movement when you're on the move. There's the sweat-free material, so you don't have to worry about cleaning up puddles when you're finished with your journey. Polar tubs hold ice for such a long period of time because of the 3-inch insulated walls, the heavy-duty gaskets, and the fail-proof hinges, which guarantee a freezer-tight seal. So check out PolarWorks.com when you're considering your next high-quality cooler without breaking the bank. That's www.polarworkz.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, two-headed fawn found in Minnesota forest shows rare wildlife deformity. This story is from the Fox News website. A mushroom hunter's discovery of conjoined white-tailed fawns in a Minnesota forest two years ago is being hailed by researchers as a landmark case among oddities in nature. The fawns, which were stillborn, are believed to have been the first recorded case of conjoined two-headed deer to have reached full term and born by their mother, according to a study recently published in the science journal American Midland Naturalist. In two other previous cases of conjoined white-tailed deer fawns, neither made it through the full pregnancy. The discovery was made in May of 2016 when a mushroom hunter came across the twins about a mile from the Mississippi River in Freeburg, Minnesota, located in the southeast portion of the state. The hunter contacted the Minnesota DNR and the fawns were frozen until a necropsy could be conducted. Lab tests, including a CT scan and MRI, revealed the fawns had two separate head-neck regions which rejoined along the spine. The fawns had normal fur, heads, and legs, but internally had a shared liver, shared spleens, and gastrointestinal tracts, according to a study co-authored by Gino D'Angelo, a researcher at the University of Georgia. Their anatomy indicates the fawns would never have been viable, D'Angelo told UGA Today. Conjoined twins are commonly found in domestic animals, especially cattle and sheep, but are rare in other wildlife, according to D'Angelo. The conjoined twins have since been mounted on a bed of greenery by Wild Images in Motion Taxidermy and will now be positioned as it is just waking from a nap. The mount will eventually be moved to the Minnesota DNR headquarters in St. Paul and placed on public display. South Dakota considers new first-time hunting license. This story is from the DeerAndDeerHunting.com website. Adult onset hunters may get a leg up in South Dakota. A new hunting license for the first-time adult hunters has been proposed that would allow new hunters to bypass the state's lottery system and hunt during their first year. The idea was proposed by Janet Lau, who teaches the South Dakota Game, Fish, and Parks Department Becoming an Outdoor Woman, BOW, workshops. Lau says women who took the class were excited to get out and hunt, only to be deterred by the state's deer hunting license lottery system, where you must apply months in advance for a chance at a license. Hence, her idea for a different first-time hunter license. Her request states that new hunters with this new license would need to be accompanied by a more experienced hunter. The SDGFP Commission voted in favor of Lux's petition, which now means that it must go through a 30-day public comment period before the new license will be approved by the commission during its May meeting. SDGFP Wildlife Division Chief Tony Leaf says that they will likely use the opportunity to change the state's youth hunting deer season into more of a apprentice hunting season that deals less with age and more with experience. By modifying the language, it would be more inclusive of new adult hunters while also making it not necessary to add a new license type. Free tick identification apps for deer hunters. Early identification and accurate information are vital in effectively responding to human and animal interaction with ticks, said experts in the and entomology department at Texas A&M University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in College Station. To help in that response, they have developed and introduced a free mobile resource named the Tick App. The Tick App was developed as a resource that resides as an internet website providing in-depth content on tick identification, biology, ecology, prevention, and management, and was designed for primary delivery on smartphones such as BlackBerry, Droid, and iPhone users using an internet browser, Teal said. It also can be accessed by a desktop or laptop computer as well as other personal portable electronic devices. The mobile app is available at tickapp.tamu.edu. Editorial note, I was also able to find an app on the Apple App Store that was developed by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please check both out. Mossberg cuts ties with Dick's Sporting Goods. 
This story is from the DeerAndDeerHunting.com website. Olaf Mossberg & Sons, Incorporated, a leading American firearms manufacturer, announced today its decision to discontinue selling products to Dick's Sporting Goods and its subsidiary, Field & Stream, in response to their hiring of a gun control lobbyist in April 2018. Effective immediately, OF Mossberg & Sons will not accept any future orders from Big Sporting Goods or Field & Stream and is in the process of evaluating current contractual agreements. It has come to our attention that Dick Sporting Goods recently hired lobbyists on Capitol Hill to promote additional gun control, said Ivor Mossberg, Chief Executive Officer of OF Mossberg & Sons. Make no mistake, Mossberg is a staunch supporter of the U.S. Constitution and our Second Amendment rights, and we fully disagree with Dick Sporting Goods' recent anti-Second Amendment actions. Consumers are urged to visit one of the thousands of pro-Second Amendment firearm retailers to make their purchase of Mossberg and Maverick firearms. Firearm retailers can be found through the Mossberg Dealer Locator by visiting www.mossberg.com forward slash dealers. For more information, visit www.mossberg.com. This concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum for leads on some of the stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Ralph and Vicki. Ralph and Vicki, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friends? Oh, we're good, buddy. How are you? We're doing well. We're doing well out here. It's, uh, you know, I'm in turkey mode 24-7. <laughs> everybody is. Yeah, it's, so it's kind of kind of hard in some sense to, to bring out some of the deer hunting thoughts that I have at this time of year. Um, okay. So I kind of have to set aside that all those those turkey memories from hours before and uh, focus. I have to focus on deer hunting for a little while. Yes, focus. See, we're going turkey hunt where we have our last season tags for turkey now, and then we actually leave soon for bear hunting. So we're going to kind of go turkey, bear, and now we're going to talk deer. So you're really going to have to go. Oh, yeah, we'll jump around. We have to dig deep into our brains to make <laughs> right. it work. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, you guys hunt all kinds of different animals and species all over the place. So, yeah, you must have to, like, switch gears quickly. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know what it is? is it, we've been doing it for so long that it, it, it becomes pretty natural. We have a routine, and we know, you know, right after the trade shows and all the appearances, you know, we start turkey hunting. From turkey hunting, we go into bear hunting. Um, in, and then in between that and then after the bear season, you know, it's food plots, it's strategies on whitetails, it's making sure we get draw, or hopefully we drew all the tags we wanted for our elk and wherever else we're applying for our moose and whatever. Um, and then... Come in August, it starts either the mountain hunts, <laughs> and uh, then it goes into everything else. So it's it's like a, a routine that's just 365. It it's never ends, which is great. You know, it's great. You're not complaining. No, I wouldn't complain. I'm not. That's the last thing I do. I, I think it's it is Whatever. interesting though. What, what Dusty and I actually met you guys I don't know, five years ago. I think it was at the Great American Outdoor Show, and the the meeting was like this. Hey, Ralph. Hey, how's it going? Looks like you're busy. Yeah, man, I'm just I'm slammed. This was during show season, right? So you're like, <laughs> it's like you just run from one spot to the next, and and that that was the extent of our meeting. Um, and I I wanted to dedicate some time to talking to both of you, getting to know you a little better, because I know our listeners will appreciate it, and then and getting to know you a little more, because it's hard to I mean, people watch your show, obviously, um, but sometimes it's hard to have a, a deep conversation when you're cruising around ATA or shot show or uh, great American outdoor show or any of the other shows. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it gets a little hard. I mean, you can't really have a conversation during those shows cause we're doing what we have to do at those shows. You know, like right now, you know, talking to you right now is middle of the day, turkey hunting here in Illinois ends at 1 PM. So, you know, we can actually sit down. We've got lots of work to do, but we can actually sit down and take some time right. out and relax, catch up, breathe, and, you know, talk hunting. Cool. All right. I'm, I'm game. Let's go back a ways uh, and, and tell us about where you both grew up, uh, your kind of your your background, some of your mentors. What what inspired you to, to get into hunting in the first place? Well, I, Vicky's pointing at me first, so I guess I'll be. <laughs> All right. <He's> first. <laughs> I grew, grew up just out of Chicago in Berwyn and Cicero and wow. um, being more of a city boy, but 
my my fam my, my mom and dad bought a little summer home and I mean it was little and it had no insulation and it was on this little lake about an hour away from our home and uh we would go up there and spend all summer long and um it was awesome I mean it was just incredible we had timber right by and you know I'd, I'd go out in the woods and I remember before I was 10 years old my mom stopped at a rummage sale or a yard sale and she bought me this longboat hmm. uh and and some arrows and I quickly realized one that the bow was too heavy for me <laughs> right. to draw. So I, I, I just drew it back as far as I could and I flung arrows. And I was mesmerized by watching the arrows. It was just so cool. And I think any any kid growing up, you know, you weren't supposed to, but you shot him in the air and, and you were like, <laughs> Oh, I can't see it, run you, you know what I mean? And and it just uh it 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 captivated me. I mean it before I was 10 years old, a bow was in my hand, and, and I had to shoot it, and then I just fell in love with it. Um, and even though, you know, from the city, uh, you know, I, I would do whatever I could from playing football and wrestling it through, through, through all of school. Um, if I'd get a break, I would drive in, ride my bike where I wasn't supposed to go in the forest preserves, and I'd take my <laughs> bow and my arrows. And I, anything that moved, I would fling an arrow at. No um, kidding. Successful. But at least I was having fun and uh, started going to archery shops. You know, mom, mom and dad would take me to an archery shop. And then we found a local one that allowed me to change the target butts. And if I changed the target butts every month, I could shoot for free. Aha. Uh-huh. So at a real early age, man, I was on the range as much as possible. And I'd shoot and I'd shoot, you know. And, and it just it just transpired into, into, you know, doing that. And then during, during after school, you know, I was working at shops and, uh, to make a long story short, went through a little bit of an accident, got my head back on straight and turned around and opened up a shop when I was 23 years old called Archer's Choice. Gotcha. Oh, so that's the origin of the name. Yes, sir. Wow. Yep. Very cool. I was, uh, I just had to do it. I mean, it was just something it's, you know, I mean, every, everybody has a calling, and I'm not saying, you know, we, we've never said we're the best at anything we do. But if you give it 110%, you'll be rewarded somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, and that's what we've been, we've been blessed. Right. Very blessed. But you had an interest and a passion for it enough to the point where you said, I'm going to try to make a living doing this. Yeah, pretty much, you know, but, but I don't, you know, if people, and we've had so many people ask, you know, well, what was your business plan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I got none. But yeah. but really clear. Right. I absolutely had none. I I just I went with the flow. I know what I want. I knew what I wanted to do. Right. I mean, I really did want to figure out a way to make a living, you know, be, being outdoors hunting. Yeah. I mean, I loved bow hunting and and I mean, there was just something about it and yeah, I just I I knew I liked working at the shops. Uh, I loved working on equipment. I loved trying to get the equipment to 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 perform better, but more than anything, I also, I, I enjoyed getting people to shoot better. Right. And, and it was just, it was, it was, you know, each individual was a challenge. Um, so, so just all in all, it was just something that I fell in love with and it just continued and was very fortunate to, you know, to build a, a really good rapport with a whole bunch of people. And, you know, Archer's Choice grew to, to one of the largest archery pro shops in the Midwest. And I mean, you know, we were very fortunate to you know, be right at the right place at the right time, hmm. and that's actually how I met Vic. No kidding. Okay, so that's that's that was the connection there as well. Pointed to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, but it was a western suburb. So okay. I grew up. It was out in DuPage County, and it was actually still considered country back then. It is no longer country. I promise you that. It's just part of Chicago now. Right. Um, and no one in my family hunted. One of my uncles did, and, you know, he was so much older than I was, and I remember going over there on, like, Thanksgiving, and they'd always have a deer hanging down in, like, the basement, like the walkout basement area and stuff like that during Thanksgiving, and that's about the extent of my hunting knowledge growing up. Um, but I've always been a tomboy. I've always loved the outdoors. I've always... And she sits here playing with her hair. <laughs> but I've always, I mean, as soon as I could get a, my first pickup truck, I had my first pickup truck. I've driven, I've driven trucks or, you know... Yukons or something since then. I mean, I just, I love being outside. I love, you know, going out, getting dirty and just having fun. Right. And um, so I was dating this guy 
and he and his buddies were, I, I, he actually, he took me up grou- grouse hunting up in northern Wisconsin, and I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved going out, walking through the woods, you know, for an intent, and actually, you know, shooting this at some grouse, and, you know, making dinner and eating it. I mean, it was, it was a really cool thing, and then they all started shooting bows, and they were, they bought their bows at this archery shop called Archer's Choice. So I was going with them, and I got tired of just hanging around, so I bought my own bow from Archer's Choice. Mm-hmm. And um, Ralph didn't even give me a discount. No, he had a boyfriend. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. bought my own bow and um, started shooting the leagues and everything like that and shot lots and lots of leagues and spent a lot of time up there at the shop. And there was just a big group of us that always hung around together. We'd go up. Um, Ralph had a house up in Twin Lakes, and we'd go up there and on Sundays, and we'd all, you know, shoot our bows and have big barbecues and just it was a lot of fun we just i mean i got to meet the whole family at that point because everyone was there on the weekend and i mean this is back in like 89 90 i guess it is Mm -hmm. somewhere way back when yeah um anyways long story short um being the other guy didn't really work out well and i had already signed up for a woman's (laughs) only deer camp through the shop through archer's choice and um so long story short I went on this. I, I went on the deer trip. I went on the deer hunt, and Ralph was my guide. Go go figure that one. Mm-hmm. And we just really hit it off. I mean, we were we always had the fun and laugh and smiles and everything like that. For I think it was say, I got my bow in eighty seven or eighty eight. So I knew him and the family and everyone like that for I don't know three or four years. Yep. And then we started dating and we got married in ninety one or ninety three rather. So you know it's just been kind of crazy. If anyone would have told me then what I'm doing now. I would have told them they were insane and crazy and there was no way. But now, I mean, right now we're, we've are we been on the Outdoor Channel. This is our 18th season on the Outdoor Channel. We're going to hit 500 episodes in July this year on OC. Wow. That's insane. Wow. Yeah, yeah right? 500. 500. Show 500 number shows. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of footage. 500 original airings. On the Outdoor Channel. Right. I mean, think, think all the years and the footage and the time and the camera work. I mean, it's just insane. 500. That's a big number. That's yeah, a, it is. It, that's a big number. When we realized that it was 500, we're like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Right. If you had to like to estimate it, how many hours of in the field shooting or just shooting in general, whether it's cameos or whatever, oh. ought, do you shoot to get at 30 minutes of a show? You know, it's funny. Is that's the first time anyone actually True, asked cameos about in. cameos in there? Because you know, normally. Well, no. I mean, I, honestly, it. it I, I don't think there is a set time allotment. I, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, sometimes sure, sure it varies. Yeah. Work out better than others um, sooner, and then you have a day or two. The guys just want to run all over the country and film, you know, cutaways and do this and do that. Um, but, but I think it would probably be safe to say. On an average, we probably have 15 to 20 hours of footage. That's not counting climbing and doing all that, but I mean, 15 to 20 hours of footage. Footage, right. Per, per, yeah, probably per, per week. Per, yeah, per, per show. Per, per trip, depending on how some high. more. But yeah, some more. Some, some maybe, less. maybe a little less, but, but I, I think we're probably safe in saying that. It's kind of funny because, you know, you never, it never really happens that you go out and you shoot an animal the very first day. Every once in a blue moon, luck would have it, you know, and then you're like, oh, well, how are we going to make a show? We need to, we should have hunted a little bit longer, but you're not going to, you know, if we're in the hand, you don't pass up. That's right. just nothing that we've ever done, you know, so it's like, okay, you know, and then you get some trips that you have hours and hours and hours of footage filmed and last minute, last light, and it always happens, you know, and you're like, all right, well, we got it. <laughs> you know, what's funny is, 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 you know, you know, we've always, we're known for not recreating a lot you know what i mean we try to keep it in real time um just because that's how we we enjoy it um we're, we're not someone that sits there behind an animal and, and puts on 20 different hats for the photo you, you know what i mean right 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 <laughs> and try to do cutaways to build a story hopefully our guys and us are working together in the field and the story's told um as it happens which is way better than recreating anything right um but but I think the the fun thing is is showing what it takes and and showing the ups and downs. You know we know so many people that you know you'll talk to them and they'll say, well you know well we don't show a a miss and we're like, do you miss? They said, well yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, well why don't you show it? Right. I mean you people will learn more from that than a hit. You know and and then I <laughs> Vicky and I were at a hotel 
and we're watching we're watching a hunting shows before we had a you know go do go do an appearance and I, I could I'll never forget it. We're watching this one show and the person hits hits the animal like right right on the rear hip and looks at the camera and says, "Man, I double lunged him." <laughs> and we're looking going that maybe they're hunting in Mars because I've never seen lungs. You know what I mean? Now, unless you got penetration, but the arrow didn't show that. And, 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 you know, we, we just want, we've always wanted to be real. Right. And, and I think hunting is a very unforgiving aspect of, of what we do. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, because you, you could be the highest of high in a millisecond and the lowest of low. And you, every, all your listeners understand that, you know what I mean? It's, it, it, and fishermen, I mean, anyone enjoying the outdoors good. Yeah. I mean, you, you could be using a top water plug casting in, in Florida and knowing you all of a sudden the water gets sucked from underneath the lure and this giant large mouth bass and you hook them and you set the hook and all of a sudden he's right to the boat and you are happier and happy. And then all of a sudden the line breaks. Right. Ouch. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, you know what I mean, and or you know you got that deer coming down the trail, and you're pumped up, and 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 you're at full draw, and and all of a sudden you take your mind out of your shot, and you shoot low or you shoot high, right? And you're like, oh. right, yeah, but we love it. It's it's um, it's akin to watching baseball in a sense. There's a lot of time spent this where there's nothing happening. You're trying to make it happen, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So if you lined up all the actual action shots. It wouldn't be that much. I mean, you could watch a full baseball game in like five minutes. Yep. And you'd have the whole thing. Hunting similar to that, uh, where I, I think, you know, you, you put a lot of time and energy and effort and scouting and, and all this other stuff, and but the actual kill shot isn't that much of it. There's, there's so much more. Yeah, it's almost anticlimactic. Right. It really is. It really is. It's like, oh. But then, all, then all of a sudden you, you have a bit of a mournful feeling. Right. You no, know, you did just take a life. Yep. But at the same time, you know, table fair, and you're thinking about throwing it out on the Traeger or something like that already because, you know, or one of the worst things is that when you miss, it's because you're already thinking about seeing the antlers on a wall right. before you shot, you know. But, I mean, it really is. I mean, it's all the whole build up to that point. And then, you know, if you're successful, it's like, ah, and, you know, your adrenaline flows. But at the same time, it's like, okay, now what? My tag is still. What am I going to do? Exactly. Exactly. There's, there is a anticlimactic. You, you nailed it. Do you... So you mentioned that you watched that television show and those hunting shows. Do you, in general, watch other hunting shows? No, no. But when we're at the ho- at a hotel room, yeah, you know, we'll sit down and and she'll yell at me, absolutely yell at me every time. Say, "Why are you watching that?" And I'm just, <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing else on. <laughs> like, I, I I love to hunt. I love to be out there. I I really don't want to watch it. <laughs> It sounds horrible. I don't even watch our own, though. So it's like they got to, like, tie us down to watch them so we can uh, approve them. I, I think the big thing is is we want to do it. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm sitting somewhere, it, you know, like we'll be, we'll be at the American, you know, we'll be at the big shows, and we'll be sitting there. And, you know, we love talking to everybody. And I, I thank God for the big, big um, phones today. Because man, it was it was hell looking at those little flip phones yeah, and sure. trying to see what they really shot. Because they'd say, "Hey, look at my deer," and you'd be like, "Huh? I couldn't <laughs> see it without you know my cheaters." Right, right. But um, you, you know, I mean, it's great to talk about it, but it's way better to do it. Right, right. No, I'm with you. I, I don't listen to other hunting podcasts in general unless somebody says, "Hey, you really should go check out this three minute segment of that particular podcast." It's the last thing that I usually do, I'll listen to other podcasts, but I don't listen to mine. I usually don't listen to others. It's just, I don't know. Yep. It's just the way it is. I, I'd rather talk to people about it. I'd rather go do it. Yep, um, right. But yeah, it, it is a, it's a funny dynamic. Did, did either of you have a hunting mentor growing up that you can kind of point, point at? Um, as a personal mentor, um, you know, I, I was fortunate to meet Fred Bear years and years ago. Oh, wow. That's excellent. And, uh, you know, an Anderson Archery Clinic. It was uh, up in Michigan, and it was the place to go. I mean, there was nothing. It was just incredible. Um, you know, and, and I'd save up everything, and, and I'd go up there. And as, as things transpired, my career took off. You know, I, I was fortunate to, to become one of the headliners up there and, and actually sit, sit on a panel with, with people that I, I always looked up to. You know, Fred, M.R. James, who started Bowhunter Magazine, mm-hmm. Judd Cooney. Um, Jimmy Doherty, you know, and here I am, this little kid that, that just like, 
eyes wide open. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was amazing to, to, to sit there and visit with those guys and others. And, I, you know, I'm missing a bunch, you know, but, but I mean, just to, just to listen to the stories. And, and I think what I learned back then was that we're human beings. We're not perfect. And these guys that, that I looked up to, you know, they would tell me that. They would say, they listen, Ralph, you're going to miss. Ralph, you're going to make bad hits. That's part of the game. Yep. He said, but the winners are going to be the ones that suck it up and understand what they got to do after the shot. And, you know, and, and uh, Bob Folkrod, you know, I was, I was very fortunate that when I started our filming career, in uh, my career in the 80s, you know, um, I hooked up with Bob and we did some caribou stuff. We did some bear. We did some mule deer. And we did white tails. And, but, you know, Bobby told me something and I, and I never forgot that either. You know, and, and Bob said, Ralphie, you want to be successful? And they all called me Ralphie. I don't know why. But Ralphie, said, Ralphie right. you want to be successful? He goes, just remember this. Don't blame your equipment. Mm. And I looked at him. I said, huh? He goes, don't blame your equipment. He said, because you spend all those hours shooting it, tuning it in and everything. And then you as a human being make the mistake. And the first thing you'll, you go to is, oh, well, this didn't work or that didn't work or this didn't. Work. No. He said, look at yourself, suck it up and say, you know what? I didn't, I didn't hold on him. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't come up on, with my pin. I didn't know the yardage, but, but it wasn't nothing but our human error. And, you know, the sooner anyone can understand that, the better off we're going to be. Hmm. Gotcha. What about you, Vicki? Do you have any mentors? Honestly, um, like I said, when I first started, and I started out by bow hunting. I didn't start out gun, well, I went and hunted grouse for one, you know, for a weekend or two, but that was it. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, my passion, and, and I would have to say it actually comes through Ralph. Okay. Only because once I got my bow and he and I really started going oh, out. Oh, you're screwed. Stuff, I know. <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> but honestly, I mean, I mean, obviously you, you learn stuff on your own as well, but I would have to say, honestly, Ralph has got to be a, be my mentor with everything that, I mean, there's other people like Brenda Valentine, you know, another woman sure. out there that sure. was stuff. And honestly, you know, I was real good friends and still good friends with Brenda Potts, you know, and things that we have done with, that I've done with her, but like Brenda Valentine being out there. I mean, she's one of the first ones that were out there. And, you know, and there's so many of them out there now. I mean, heck, I've shared camps with, like, Candy Kiske. And, and even with with Tiffany, we were up caribou hunting. I mean, there's just there's a bunch of great women out there hunting and promoting this sport. And that's what we need to do. We need to promote this lifestyle because, obviously, we need it to continue to grow and not continue to lose numbers like it is. Right. I think, like, from the very, very beginning, I would have to say it would have been Ralph. Okay. All right. Pretty pretty good, Ralph, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Huh? <laughs> uh, but I order something now. Yeah, I want flowers and candy. No. <laughs> uh, absolutely, work it. Um, <laughs> as far as like, man, I always ask this of the couples that I interview who are in the outdoor industry and and working together. What's it like working with your spouse? Oh my gosh, it's horrible. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, honestly, Ralph and I, I would have, and he probably, I would think he would agree with me. We, That's why I'm not even answering. We, I know, I know the answer. We, we know the answer. We've truly blessed. Okay. Seriously. But we have our company, which is Archer's Trace Media. Um, we've had the business well before the TV show. So, cause we, you know, when, when I first, when we first got married, he was already producing hunting videos at the time. And then it went to DVDs and then it went to the TV show. So we've had the business for quite a while. Um, right now we currently have seven employees in the building with us. So, I mean, we have an everyday kind of in-the-office work thing when we're here. And then we travel. And honestly, we seriously are together probably 24-7, 365 days, maybe, maybe a week. He may go on a trip and I don't go with him. No kidding. So, I mean, for us to get along as well as we do, it is crazy. It's kind of like yin and yang. I mean, we just, we balance each other very well. We've been on trips where... We're couples oh, that hunt, couples. but they, they work different jobs and they're together for a week straight in a camp and you're thinking they're going to kill each other, <laughs> right. you know? And, right. But yeah, you know, so honestly, we, we, we definitely take our, our, our marriage and how we can handle each other a blessing because that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, that's, there's no reason why we should get along as well as we do. <laughs> well, if you think about all the time that you spent together and what, 30 years and you're, and you're, you're 500 like, episodes, 500 episodes <laughs> and you're still Still together? That's amazing. Yeah, no, right? How rare is that? It's I don't know, but shoot me, would you? <laughs> <laughs> it only feels like right. seventy years, you know. Yeah. It, right. it, it, <laughs> you know, I, I think what it boils down to is just is you have this compatibility. Yeah. You, you yeah. know what I mean? And, and and let's face it, no one's perfect. 
And I think if both of us, both of whoever it is, you know, you understand that and you say, listen, I, you know, we can work through this or, or let's do this or, you know, let's do that. And both has to be willing. You know, we, we've been in so many hunting situations where we're like, well, you know, should we go to the left or should we go to the right? And, and I, even though I've done it longer than her, you know, I'm still, I'll still turn around and look at her and ask her and say, you know, because boy, two heads are better than one, right. you know, and, and right. I mean, even with our camera guys. You know, it's not always just, hey, this is the way it's going to be, and that's it. You sit there and you go, guys, what do you think? You know, we got the wind coming in, coming from, you know, east, heading west. You know, what, what do you, should we, should we go this way? or You know, and, and I think you, you sit down and you strategize on it, and, and I think that's how a successful marriage is going to be, too. Right, right. Give and take. Yep. Yeah. No, no, nobody's right all the time, that's for sure. Nope. Right. That's they a- may think they are, but, you know, you just got to... <laughs> I'm like, really? (laughs) So you started this archery shop and it was kind of the beginning of, of your business career in, in this outdoor adventure. When did you decide to say, all right, so I've got the archery shop. I need to start filming my hunts. When did that progression begin? Um, I actually started, uh, because of the shop, the popularity of the shop, we had a, a bunch of different TV crews. I mean, from Chicago and all them, they were, they kept coming in and ended up teaching a bunch of the, the reporters how to shoot a bow and arrow. Um, had a lot of the athletes coming in, hmm. was very fortunate to meet, to meet and, and actually become friends, you know, with, with the great Walter Payton and a bunch of the bears from the 80s, you know, the eighties on, right. um, Bo Jackson, I mean, just Jody Davis, Keith Moreland, all, all different guys, Carlton Fisk, uh, Phil Clawson. He was, he was, uh, the strength trainer for the White Sox. Yep. He was, I mean, he was just a, he's still a stud of a human being, uh, you know, and, and he ended up teaching, you know, getting me involved in, in lifting more and doing it right and doing it better and gaining strength and meeting all kinds of other athletes. And the shop started to grow the popularity of the shop and, then a gentleman, a couple of guys, Spence Petros, uh, he's in the Fishing Hall of Fame. He, he was actually editor for Fishing Facts magazine for 20-some years. Okay, all right. He, uh, he and I hooked up, and then he introduced me to uh, the outdoor writer for the Chicago Tribune, John Hussar. Hmm. And this is in the 80s, early 80s. Um, and John started writing about my adventures. And most of my adventures were going, going up north or going out west, mainly on my own, didn't have any money. Um, you know, trying to grow the business and everything and, and shooting some pretty good critters. Um, and then with him writing about it, especially on the Sunday Tribune, you know, that was syndicated. So it, you know, it just kept growing. And the next thing you know is, you know, Babe Winkleman came in, he filmed some stuff and really enjoyed just that aspect of it. So we ended up making an investment and, uh, you know, got, got the, all the camera gear and started doing it. And that was, you know, just heck, that was like second or almost, yeah, two years after we opened the shop. Gotcha. And then it just continued and, you know, was fortunate to pick up sponsors and, you know, financially they were supporting what I was doing, um, allowed the videos to get sold. And then from videos, you know, Vicky came on board and then we went from the videos to DVDs and there were no couples at the time, you know, doing any hunting together, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, on some type of medium platform um and so here we go from the from the te- from the videos to dvd series you know with vicky and i uh our, our manufacturers started saying hey guys you should look at this tv stuff and that was in the late 90s mm. and we're like well we didn't we don't we ain't never done tv and they said but you're doing it anyways so we we got together we submitted a pilot to the outdoor channel and it was immediately accepted and the rest is history gotcha wow <laughs> It's pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. If you are looking back on this, do you think you this could be recreated today with the challenge you have with a uh, just lack of hunters, that the decreasing numbers and the the change in where people are, are watching television, or is, do you think that you could start from scratch and still do it successfully? I I don't want to take anything away from anybody trying to live their dreams, right, Vicki? I mean, right. we don't. Right. But do we believe it? No. I, I don't. What What has happened has happened. Um, you know, with TV, TV has reached its peak. Um, as like you stated, you know, there are new ways that people are viewing content. 
Um, but still, TV, whether people believe it or not, is still king um, mm-hmm. due to the demographic that has the affordable income to buy the equipment, to go on the trips. Um, yes, the kids are, you know, are viewing it, viewing stuff on their phones, but the majority of your adults that are more stable in their career, you know, and if you look at the demographics in their mid forties on up, um, you know, they still, you know, they, they may not watch TV at the certain times, but what they do is they DVR their stuff. Mm. Um, you know, so, so, that, so they're watching that. And I'm not just saying that because we're, we do TV. I mean, you know, we're very fortunate to have, you know, a good social media base, um, you know, and we're adding to it more and more every day. Right. Um, but because I think you have to, you have to reach out to, I guess you would probably say every genre there is to try to just keep things going, but for it to happen again, no. I mean, it's just like, you know, is, is there going to be a, another Ralph and Vicky? No. Is there going to be another, you know, Ted Nugent? No. Michael Waddell? You, you, know, you know what I mean? Right. I mean, this, yeah. I think, I don't, I think, you know, Lee and Tiffany or Don and Candy, Kiskey. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't think. You know, that's, it was here, and it's, it's here still, but, you it's know. It's going to be different when it's the digital content, I think. I think it's not going to be the same as a TV. No, TV, TV always had a, a status where social media really doesn't, if you think about it. There's so many influencers on social media. Yeah. There's so many people on <clears throat> social media. And then you also got to look at it the market-wise. Like you were saying, with, you know, hunter numbers are going down. Right. Oh, manufacturer budgets are getting smaller because right. hunter numbers are going down. So it, it, it continues to be harder and harder every year to stay on the television. Mm-hmm. Well, you're right. You're spot on, Vic. And then, I mean, I mean, one of the other things that we don't look at is, you know, the pie is the pie. Right. And the pie is decreasing. Right. And, and so, so let's look at it this way. You know, when we, when we first started all this um, and others, you know, in the 90s when just things were, even in the 80s when it was just crazy, Boy, anything you had to do with archery and bull hunting was selling. I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah. You know, you had you had a half a dozen, let's say, bow manufacturers and a half a dozen broadhead manufacturers, and you had two or three arrow manufacturers. And that's when the numbers were the strongest. Now you have 50 right. <laughs> different broadhead manufacturers. You have 30 bow manufacturers. You have, you know, 25 arrow men. And, and so the pie didn't get bigger. It got smaller, and now everyone's taking a little chunk of it. Right. So for us, you know, for manufacturers, budget-wise, they're like, well, we don't have the dollars to spend like we did. So, so I mean, all in all, you know, the reach is, is not what it used to be. Right, right. Yeah, it's a it's a weird dynamic and watching <laughs> how you watch television, uh, looking at, it seems, everything seemed watered down, like you stated, you know, and, and I didn't really think of it like that initially, but you're right, it's like, you have all this media and it's like it's, it's there's so many participants. It's watered down in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know how old you are, but I mean, you know, when I was growing up, you got news either in the morning when dad, dad and mom were up to go to work, yep. and you were getting ready to go to school, or when you came home at five o'clock. You know, you know what I mean? After the playground and all that, you, everyone sat to dinner, and dad would always have the news on. Yep, right, right. It's the television. You turn on the television, and and listen to the the nightly news. That's it. That's how you got it. I'm 47, by the way. <laughs> okay. So see, so I, I mean, so, so you grew up in the same time. Right. You know, and, and, and I mean, you, now you have news 24-7. You don't even know where to go. Right. You don't even know where, who to listen to because you, you want to listen to these people, but then they all of a sudden go to the way extreme and you're like, I don't know. And then you, you don't want to listen to the others because they're the other way that you believe in. So, I, I mean, it just, you know, and, it, and it's like hunting today. Right. If you, if you want to watch, if you just Google up, uh, you know, bow hunt for elk and you get inundated, you know, with selections. Right. And let's face it, you know, there's, there's probably a fair amount of them that we wish weren't on there. Right. Right. That's a good point. Uh, you, you know, and, and so, so I, I think if anything, if I hope someday we can, when, when Vicki and I walk away and we hand it down to RJ, our son, who's, you know, really moving up and taking care of things is, you know, I, I pray that someday, you know, we're looked back on and, and, and they say, you know what, there's Ralph and Vic, man. They they did good for yep. us. Yep. They, you know, they didn't hurt us because, boy, there's a lot today that's hurting us. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Lots lots and lots of challenges. Let's, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about some of your 
deer hunting strategies? I mean, you, you, you hunt out West, you hunt out East, you hunt Midwest, you hunt all over the place. Probably more than most hunters, you've had a lot of rich experiences with multiple species of deer. Can you, and, and this is probably not a fair question, do you have, uh, if you had to pick between mule deer hunting and whitetail hunting, mm. could you pick one? Ooh, that ain't fair. <laughs> <laughs> They're different. Mm. They're so different. I, I mean, I don't, I, think, yeah. well, I don't think I'd answer that question if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we live in Illinois. Yep. So we have whitetail in the backyard. Right. And front yard. In front yard, inside right. yard. And, you know what I mean? So, I mean, we live out in northwestern in Illinois in the timber. So we have deer, all of, whitetails all around us. Right. I think if, I mean, when we're home or we're hunting whitetails, you know, we get excited when we look at the cameras, you know, the photos that come through on the cameras and stuff like that. And it's exciting. And, and mule deer are just a totally different because it's a destination for us at that point. Yeah, right, right, right. It's really hard to put the two... If we lived out west, we may say the opposite. Yeah. You know, where if we had mule deer, it'd be in our backyard and we wouldn't think about it. So, I mean, we love our whitetail hunting, but, like, if we're going to go mule deer hunting, we're like, yeah, we're going out to Colorado or we're going to Washington. Right. Because you're excited because it's a trip. It's an experience, right? It's a different type of experience. You know, and it's going to, you're going to see old friends. And, I mean, there are just so many things there. And, you know, I I think there's, there's, there's a tactic that we would, that we swear by. And it's not about the calls. It's not about the scent. It's nothing about none of that. It's about three things that you don't hear a lot of people talk about. And it's the most critical things in, on this planet when you know, it comes to trying to pattern any game. Food, cover, and water. Period. Right, right. You learn those three things, and I don't care where you are, what you're hunting. Food, cover, and water. You are going to have opportunity. Right, right. Carry that amongst any species, really. Absolutely. Right. right. That's what they need. It's crazy. Yeah, that's it, to survive. Right. So they're, they're not like human beings. None of these animals just walk around going, well, you know, I'm going to walk to McDonald's or I'm going to go here. No, they have a purpose for everything. Yeah, right. They don't waste their time. You know what I mean? They, 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 every day for, for these wild animals, our survival. Right. And once you can get into that mode, I mean, God gave us, the, the, he set our eyes in front of our head for a reason, to make us the ultimate predator. Right. It is interesting that if you look at every species they're just you like you said they're trying to survive and they're going to do it in the most efficient manner possible and if you can key in on whatever species plug you know plug in mule deer plug in whitetail plug in turkeys plug in whatever it is it's all the same yes, it is. it's a good perspective thank you for clarifying that that's, that's i don't think we've simplified it very much on the show we've always uh, got into the the details but that's well, you know, but but that's the habit of all of us. Right, you know, we, right. we want to, and we've always wanted to try to portray that we know more than the other guy. But the reality of it is, is it's three things. Right. If you figure out what they're eating at the given time you're out there, if you figure out where they're sleeping, and you figure out where they're drinking, you use the wind in your favor. You, something's going to happen. You got it. Right. Let's take a coffee break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Ralph and Vicky. How many of you? have eaten a vine-ripened, juicy tomato picked fresh from the garden. How does that compare to the bland, pale, hard tomatoes that you've seen at the grocery store during the winter? No comparison, right? Well, if the coffee that you typically drink comes from a can or whatever was on sale that week, you owe it to yourself to give Hunter's Blend a try. Just like store-bought tomatoes don't hold a candle to the fresh ones from your garden, Store-bought coffee doesn't hold a candle to select specialty-grown, fresh roasted coffee. Store-bought coffee, and most coffee for that matter, comes from cheap, inferior-grade coffee beans because they're cheaper. Farmers in Nicaragua and Thailand select their top beans, which are then purchased direct by the folks at Hunter's Blend Coffee, where they custom roast beans in their central Ohio roastery to produce a premium-grade coffee. Just like that first bite of a ripe, juicy tomato, one sip of fresh-brewed Hunter's Blend coffee is all that it will take for you to realize that you've never really had coffee until now. Go to huntersblendcoffee.com to order some today. And as always, let your local hunting store know about Hunter's Blend coffee so they can carry it in their store. Hunter's Blend coffee. We're hunters too. Let's pick up where we left off and continue our conversation with Ralph and Vicki. What what do you find the and we talked about similarities. What's the biggest difference between hunting mule deer and hunting whitetail to you? Well, I, I honestly, you, you know, I, I mean, you could say terrain because where we live, yeah. but the problem is, is there's people that hunt deer, you know, on the, in the ridges and the valleys. So 
terrain really, I, I think, would be knocked completely out. Um, I, I love, I love when you get someone and says, "Well, you know, mule deer are so much stupider than than a white-tailed deer." <laughs> And I'm like, oh, really? How many mule deer over 170 inches have you shot? Right. You, you, you know what I mean? And, and they're like, well, you know, but they are. You know, they, they, you spook them, they run 50 yards, turn around and look back. And I said, how do you know the deer don't, whitetails don't do that? If you're hunting them in thick woods, they run, they run 25, 30 yards, they stop and they look back. What's what spooked them? Right. I said, so don't judge a mule deer just because they, I mean, they live out more in open terrain. They utilize their eyes, I think, way more, you know, than maybe their other senses, you know, because they're just looking for movement way out there. Um, but, well, I'll tell you, you know, you, you start hunting muleys, you really earn a great, phenomenal, phenomenal respect for them right away. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. I mean, okay. wow. They're just, it's such a cool animal. Let's talk about scent control a little bit. You talked about playing the wind. Do yeah. you go that extra step to fortify yourself with every scent control system that's out there or are there some that you focus on more than others? Yeah, I'd say there's more we focus on. Um, we have used HS scent away earth spray forever. Okay. Period. Yeah. And, and I, and I think Vicki and I'll tell you straight out from Alaska to Africa and everywhere in between, if you pick up dirt and smell it, it smells like dirt. Right. And, and I love that cover scent. I mean, you know, I would take old leaves and, and, and try to put that in my, but boy, you give me earth scent and I'm, we are happy campers. And we're always playing the wind anyways. I mean, that's something that it doesn't matter with what we're doing. You always got to, how many times we try to go out and we're like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to go sit in that stand where that big buck's walking past the camera. And then the wind's wrong for that stand. And you're like, I could chance it. And then we have this discussion here in the office and they're like, no, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't. It. Don't it. do it. You're going to screw up the pattern. <laughs> you know, I mean, no matter how much you try, you're always going to have some kind of scent on you. Right. Gotcha. Keep your clothes as clean as, as possible. As clean as possible. Spray down. Yeah. You know, I, I, take scent free showers, scent away showers and do the best that you can, but you still have to watch which way the wind is blowing. We'll, we'll watch people, you know, we'll watch them getting out of their vehicle and get, you see them pumping gas. Now here's the deal. I mean, if you live on a farm and, you know, diesel fuel is not your enemy then. <laughs> Cow manure is a great cover scent if the animals are used to it. And, and right. the best way to explain that is you go on, you go on, you know, someone lets you hunt their land. And you, the landowner goes out in the field and the deer never spook. And you're like, okay, well then, heck, these, these animals are tame here. You walk out and every animal, you know, starts blowing and snorting and running away. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Well, because the animals got acclimated to the individuals that always see them, and there's no threat to them. They under they know that scent, yeah, and it's never been a threat. So, so I mean, there are things that will help. Uh, I mean, natural cover scents are are a big plus, and I think keeping your clothing, your boots, as clean and scent free as possible. And when I say scent free, I don't know if there's truly anything that eliminates human odor completely. No, I really don't. I don't believe there is. But I, I think if you can get the natural odors that are in the area and don't overuse them either, um, boy, I, I think you're, you're in a big plus and keep, keep them as clean from human scent and, uh, you know, other scents that are not in the area is, is the key too. That's, you know, that you're keying on something that's pretty cool there is that you're in, use the scents that are in the area. That doesn't mean you're going to use the scents from the Northeast and try to use them in the Midwest, like the different smells, or even if you go across town, maybe there's another smell over there that's unique. Maybe you're at a farm as opposed to being in deep woods, you know, they're different smells, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, Vicki, she, she, she wanted to kill me first start. Oh my out. gosh. When we first started, started hunting together and he, we, we were hunting on a, on a farm that had raised cattle that they raised cattle. So, so one day we go out there just do a little scouting, and he picks up these cow pies, and I'm like, "Dry, they were dry." They, yeah, <laughs> and he stuck them in a bucket of like a five gallon bucket of water yeah. and dissolved them, and then filled up the spray bottle. And when we went hunting, he sprayed me down with that. Uh -huh. And stuff. You, you're like, I've got, yeah, "He's a <laughs> and keeper." And what happened? Right. What you had? Huh? You had deer all around you. Yeah, and I smelt like it's all right. doo doo. I'll, I'll <laughs> smell like cow crap any day. I don't day. know if I can say I, that or not. I, I, I'll smell like cow crap any day if I could have the deer around me. 
Yeah. So, so, you, you know, so Vicky, you must have been saying, okay, I've got deer all around me, but I smell like cow poop. Exactly. I'm like, is it worth it? You know, mm, and then, you know. Then balance this out. Yeah, let me balance it out. You right. know what? I'd rather smell like earth spray. Yep. <laughs> let me use some earth sun. Let me spray <laughs> down. That actually takes away my, that makes me smell like dirt rather than poop. Right. You know, I, I definitely would rather go that direction. Right, right. You don't, you don't see poop smell, smelling like, you know, sent away spray. There's a reason for it. You don't want to go around smelling like poop. Well. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that'd be a big seller, but. No. But you can make know. your own, right, Ralph? That's it. If someone shoots the new world record, you know, walking through cow pies, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, no, it's no. not going to happen. No. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Let's talk about betting and cover. You you mentioned you know of the three, betting and cover is a, a big big thing for you as a as a hunter. Does it apply for muleys and a whitetail as far as you're concerned? And and if so, what is it you're looking for in hunting out west versus hunting where you live? Well, first you got to you got to realize the weather. You know what I mean? And and temperature wise, and where where what the weather is going to do and move the animals. If you you know if if you're if most of you got early season. Those animals don't want to sit in the middle of the sun. They don't want to, you know, they're, they're going to go where it's cooler. So your dark timber draws, your north-facing facing slopes instead of your south-facing. You know, temperatures will regulate a lot of the movement for you. Um, and, and cover is the ability you, to, to, to allow them a sanctuary. You know, cover's not just brush. You know, to me, cover mean, means a lot of different things. You know, cover is where they can go somewhere and feel secure, but also they have to have their escape routes. You know, a lot of these guys cutting trees down and they're forming these little pockets. But if there's no escape route for a big mature animal, he's not going to go hang in there. But if he has, if he has alleys or, you know, veins to get through this thick cover, but still get in there and hide, oh my gosh, you know, you can create better cover and habitat. And when you start to put that all into play and strategically set up your areas, now, if you can't, I mean, if you're going on public land and, and just in somewhere, you, can, you can't. But you can sure do a lot of scouting back home. You can go on, set, check out satellite photos, look at drainages, look at ditches, you know, and, and, and I mean, you can pinpoint. You're a hunter. You're a predator. You can pinpoint some of these locations before you've ever been there. Lock them on your GPS. Lock them on your phone or whatever, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, as you get out there, you eliminate a lot of just hiking and climbing and, you know, dispersing your scent everywhere go to those pinpoint areas and try to you know isolate them in a quick period of time to give you more quality hunting time gotcha all right let's let's focus in on some of the the food stuff all right so we we covered the the wind we covered and and scent control we covered cover and and bedding what what are you looking for when it comes to food obviously you have to eat as you mentioned you know these are the basics but there's a lot of different things to look at, um, both in mule deer hunting and whitetail hunting, um, different terrain, different, I and mean, whitetail, you always hear about food plots. Do, are, you, are you thinking food plots? Are you thinking natural agriculture? Or what is it you're keying off of uh, when it's time to think about where should I hunt based off of what they're eating? You know, I, I think part of that is we do have our food plots. We live here in Illinois, so we can't do any supplemental feeding. We can't do any mineral licks. We can't put anything out whatsoever here in Illinois. So we do, we're allowed to have food plots. So we do um, put food plots out, but honestly, it really depends on the timing. If the, if we have a great acorn crop, obviously we're going to want to be in the timber at that time because that's where they're going to be. They're not necessarily going to be running around out in our food plots. And the cameras show us a good deal too. It helps us decide where we need to be and where, at, you know, at the certain times of the year. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, you know, food, food is relative to where you're at. Right. You know, you know, I, I think people and a lot of a lot of people who do what we do won't admit this, mm-hmm. but here we are. Let's cause some. Let's start some controversy. Perfect. Oh. Love it. <laughs> uh, and here it goes. <laughs> In the Midwest, it is truly easier to pinpoint and hunt white-tailed deer, mm. and I'll tell you why. And you know this because we don't have large stands of timber. We have small little farm lots. We have, you know, and a lot more ag. So you can pinpoint these natural, you know, area, these funneling areas that if you, if all you can do is just sit there and give it the time and have the patience, somewhere, sometime, that deer that you got a picture of is going to come through there. 
But when you're hunting giant stands of timber, what do you do? You, you know what I mean? The guys out east and, and down south and up north, I mean, they have literally millions of acres of timber, and they're, they struggle, but yet they're successful. What they end up doing is realizing a few things. Is One, they locate the food source. Mm-hmm. When Vicky nailed it, is your acorn crop, you know, in big stands of timber. Right. Um, the, the other thing is, is start studying some of the foliage. Because there's certain plants that these that that some of the animals you're hunting are going gravi- to gravitate to more than others. Um, the other thing is study topo maps. The topographics are going to turn around and they're going to drive these animals. See, animals are just like human beings. They want to take the easiest accessible route to get to their favorite spot. Period. Right. So, so I mean, if you can learn that and read that, boy, it's, it's just going to give you that much more of an advantage. You know, and and food. I mean, yes, in the Midwest. What do you got? You got coin, co- corn, you got soybean. Yeah, I, I mean, you go up north, you got sorghum, you got milo, you've got all these things. Yeah, and I mean, it's always, it's there, it's prevalent. You got winter wheat, you got winter rye. I, I mean, you've got all of these things. And what we try to do where we live, um, you know, we set up most of our plots for late, late season. Hmm. Why? We can't compete with the thousands of acres of soybeans and cornfields. We can't. But what we do is we get to we know where the deer bed in the late season, so we put our small little food plots in and around close to the bedding areas, and knowing the prevailing winds, you know, we, we set them up for those occasions. And yes, maybe we can only hunt a spot once or twice, or if we're lucky, three or four times a year. But those, th- you know, those few times that we get in there over that food source are pretty productive. Yeah. Right, and even like on like the one piece that we call the thirty three. We know that we cannot hunt there with any type of north wind. And, of course, you know, here in the northern <clears throat> Illinois, our, our normal wind come wintertime is northwest. It's our predominant wind. Um, so we have stay, we, the way we have our plots, you're always going to have a little bit of the south that you can always, you know, because, gosh, last fall was warm for quite a bit of the time. So, I mean, we were able to hunt that more often. Than we had we more east winds last year than I can remember. Right. Yeah, which really, really messed us up. Oh. So, I mean, we were end up putting up a new stands just because the wind and the way we have our plots out there, and we have them set basically for those northwest winds. Now, like the 33, we know that that's a spot. It's a little honey hole. There's a little food plot in there, and it holds deer. For whatever reason, this little piece, it holds deer. And we know that we cannot go in there with a the north wind. No. Nope. We, just, we just know it. And the reason being is because on the, the south side of this property is the bedding area. Yeah. There's nothing we can do. We're not going to change their bedding area. We can't do it. We can't put a stand over on that side of the property. So we have to go ahead and we have to hunt only south winds. So that is blowing us up into the cornfield behind yep. us. Yep. You know, so that's But on occasion we've been busted there. All of a sudden the deer come from the north, which yeah. they normally never do. Yeah, but they come from across the road there, yep. across from the cornfield, what are you gonna do? and all of a sudden they're blowing behind you. And you're like, you know what? It doesn't matter. You just got to go out there, you know, and when it's supposed to be your turn, it's going to be your turn. And when it happens, it happens. You know, it just, it's the right place at the right time. Right, right. Yeah, the, the winds were wacky. Uh, this oh, past yeah. Fall, just strange Every temperatures. Time. Yeah, it was, it was a weird year for sure. Yeah, it was. And, you yeah. know, and then we got, we got cold real early and we're like, oh, my gosh, it's going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden, 70 degrees hit. Yeah. Wow. Yep. We had plots actually turn sour. No kidding. Yeah. I had not heard that. That's insane. Yep. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, let's talk about some memorable deer hunts. I mean, you've shot 500 shows. I don't, I don't even know where you start, but is there <laughs> one for each of you that kind of sticks out as your a memorable deer hunt? Go on, Vic. Um, you know, that, my favorite would have to be my biggest deer. Okay. Oh, uh, here goes. Because <laughs> it happens the biggest right. one in the house still. I knew it. Still the biggest yeah. in the house. Okay. All right. It, it's the biggest white tail we have in the house in the office. So, you know, it's one of those stories. Um, but honestly, I think that probably is my most memorable. Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree with it? I oh, mean, yeah. I've, no shot, some, I've shot some great deer, and everyone, every one of them has a story. You know, <clears throat> they really do. I mean, there's just different things that happen. And um, my, my big Colorado buck, though, I mean, I'll never forget that it was, you know, like November 13th, and Ralph and I are sitting in a tree stand. He's filming me. And what we normally do is before we had the camera guys with us, because this is back in like 06, yeah. um, he and I, we'd flip a coin to see who gets to hunt first. And then whoever hunted in the afternoon hunted that next morning. And then we'd swap out cameraman per- and hunter just because if you shot something in the afternoon, you didn't want to screw up that person's morning hunt. So that's how we, <laughs> we just kind of did. We, we had a plan, you know? Right. And um, 
And so we were out. It was my afternoon to hunt, and we're sitting out there in the no. green field. Time out. What? It wasn't your afternoon to hunt. It was my afternoon to hunt. No. How do you sit here? I, gave, I let. Oh, you let me. Yes. Oh, remember? No, I don't no, remember. Yes, no, I did. I did. And, I, no, and I told everybody after that, I'll never do go, that again. Go take your poop spray. Yeah, go yeah, on no, out of there. No. <laughs> it was my turn to hunt. Well, then you really messed up. I did. I screwed up. <laughs> you can have the bragging rights of the biggest nah, deer in the house. Right. <laughs> anyway, we were, um, were sitting in this old, what was it, a Russian olive or a... Yeah. Yeah, right, it was some right on the tree. fringe. Of it was the right on the fridge. It wasn't the cottonwood because we couldn't fit a tree stand in yep. the cottonwood where we wanted it because the cottonwood was just too big. Yep. And um, we're sitting there, and it's it's like I said, it's middle of November, and we're looking at the green field. And the green field, seriously, is probably 150, 200 winter yards. Wheat. Winter wheat. Winter yep. wheat. Well, yeah, green field winter wheat. And um, so we're sitting there, and like it's like I don't know, three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, and all these deer start coming out. Come, start coming out of the tamaracks out of the, the river bottom area and they're all bucks and they're all together in the middle of november and we're just like what in the world couldn't it? believe it. it it didn't even make sense we have no idea why it was that way but they did and there's only a couple does with them and then um we ended up we're sitting there and a really nice eight point with a split two oh, remember that guy huge. huge body big deer i mean the antlers were beautiful and then all of a sudden, this the other one comes out, and his body, he was not as heavy body no, size no. as the eight with a split two on him, but um, he comes out, and we're like, whoa, that guy's got some antlers on his head. So we started, uh, we're, we're looking at him, I did some rattling, we're all filming it, I'm rattling, they don't even lift their heads up, tried doing a couple grunts, nothing's hearing it, nothing's looking at it, and Ralph is like, Vic, he's like, you know, do the snort wheeze. So we take out the easy wheeze, and I go ahead and we do a snort wheeze, and they lifted their heads. We're like, oh, well, hey, look at this. What's going to happen now? So we did it one more time, and that big eight with a split two, and then this big deer, this other big buck, they kind of, like, look at each other, and the eight looked at that big guy, and he just put his head back down and started feeding on the winter wheat again. Absolutely showed his subordinates. It was incredible. It was insane. And then this big guy, this big buck, he, like, looks in the direction of our stand, and not looking at us, but looking in the direction. So we're probably 150, 200 yards from him at this point, huh? 150 yeah. probably. And he just starts walking towards us. He gets to, to the cattle fence. Jumped he in. jumps the cattle fence. He comes walking through the tamarack. It was like he was on a street. It was like he, yeah, he knew where that sound came from, and he was coming to find out who made that noise. He was mm. coming to fix some butt. And he came in, and he got to about... 17 yards from me, broadside, and bam, that was the end of it. I shot my, you know, I beam and I, 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 man, my hoist just like threw it out there and he ran, he stopped, he ran a little bit more and then he went behind the tamarack so we couldn't see him and I just lost it. I was shaking, the tree was shaking, Ralph was shaking. I mean, if there had been a camera on him and I in the tree stand, it would have been even funnier. <laughs> Oh, Ralph? Oh, yeah. I mean, we were shaking. Back then, I wish we would have. I wish we would have, like, because, I mean, it was shaking horribly. And all I mean, that. I'm like, my adrenaline, <clears throat> I'm really pretty calm. I am, I'm usually really calm until I shoot. And uh-huh. then I shoot, and then my adrenaline just comes up from my toes all the way to the top of my head, and my body shakes, and my hands start going crazy, and they start flipping around, my legs go crazy. So I'm shaking, and he bends over, and he's so many, he's like, Vic, I think you just broke 200. And I'm like, no. He's like, yes. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I think you did. So we give it a little time. We get down, and we're following the blood trail, amazing blood trail with it. And we get up on it, and he has just got mass. He ended up going 203 and 5 eight. Wow. Wow. And he has got 25 inches of mass circumference on him and 25-inch main beams on each side. So I had 100 inches just in mass and beam length. It just, yeah. That's a nice was, deer. That's a really nice yeah. deer. Yeah. He two. just got stuff all over the place. And I'll never forget, Ralph and I were, he's recording, you know, he's filming me walking up on this thing. And all I kept saying was, like, oh my God, oh my God. And I sound like a record, a broken yeah. record. But I was like, cool. So I sit down and I'm looking at it. And me being me, it's just my personality and sarcasm and the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I sit down. This goes, wait, this goes back to how you said, how, how you know, how do you, how have we lasted this whole time? <laughs> So, so I'm sitting behind this amazing deer that I will probably never, ever beat in my lifetime. You know, I'll never break that record um, for my own personal best. And I grab hold of it, and it's got these eye guards, and it's got, like, I don't know, it's got a whole bunch of oh, stickers yeah, coming off the eye guards. I mean, he's got all kinds of trash on his eye guards. 
And I'm like, I looked at Ralph and I go, see, I told you I was going to shoot a buck with eye guards goofy like this. And he just looked at me like, I can't believe he me? said that. Because, <laughs> you know, I all the, the deer I had shot up to that point all had like just regular eye guards. And then we saw one that had like split eye guards and some other stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to shoot one of them one of those days. <laughs> and then I shoot this deer and I'm like, see, I told you so. And he's just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That's a great, it is. That's great story. Cool. Great deer. I mean, anything over 200 is just amazing. Yeah, you know, I mean, that just, I couldn't even, that was, it was just a fluke. You know, we we would go out to Colorado, we'd hunt on a ranch, we would just basically get trespass, trespass, trespassing rights. Right. You know, so right. we were out there doing our own thing, setting up our own stands and everything. And when we talked to Billy, the landowner, you know, afterwards, and we were showing it to him, he said, you know, he goes, he may have seen him that winter before out there where there was a lot of snow, and he may have seen him at that time. He goes, but otherwise he'd never seen him there. Wow. Huh. So, yeah, it was, it was, like I said before, it's like if it's meant to be. Right. It's, yep. It's going to happen. Little strategy, little luck. Yep, yep. exactly. Yep. Exactly. A lot of luck. A lot of luck. A lot of luck. Gotcha. All right, Ralph, what do you got for us? Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I, I think I would probably still have to say, too, back on the same place. I spot and stalked a massive mule deer, mm. um, bedded down in sage flats, uh, took our boots off, went in our socks, and had Vicky stay about 50 yards in back of us, in back of me, um, and I kept crawling because forward. Because didn't want me to mess, make anything, mess <laughs> up anything. Crawling forward, 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 um, winds in our favor. We, I could just see his tines through the sage. Yeah. Um, came to full draw at like 40 yards yep. and bleed it didn't do anything. So I, I, you know, I came back down. I figured I'm going to try to get closer. Got within 30. I'm ranging. I'm checking everything and nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I got to 20 yards, 21 yards, I think, to be exact. Yeah. I stopped at 40. I was like, there is no way I'm getting any closer. I can zoom in if I need to, because if I mess this up, it's the end of me. (laughs) So Vicky's over my shoulder, a little further back and I come to full draw. I got my Hoyt full out there and I'm just holding and and I figured I'm only going to have a second. And I was trying to hold where I thought when he stood up, my pin would be already there. Yep. Um, and grunted, nothing. <laughs> Snort wheezed. He stood straight up and he looked back. And I had the sun to my back, which was a, a, a plus, because I think it just made him hesitate that much longer. Yep. And, I mean, as, he, as you could see it on camera, as he's coming up and just starts to turn... That Spitfire just pins his crease, and he runs about 40 yards and piles up, and he ended up um, going 228, and, and, I mean, just tons of mass. I mean, just, just an incredible mule deer, to, you know, for Vicky and I to be there together and, and to, to do it, you know, by spotting and stalking. To me, that's the ultimate way to hunt anyways. I love it. Uh, you know, and it just to all to come together was probably probably my Mardi Gras you know, wow. those it was things cool. that'll, it yeah. Was, after he shot and we watched that buck, you know, you just watch his arrow just go over the sagebrush and it just hits him. And, um, it, that buck, he goes and he runs like 30 yards and, and drops. And he, Ralph just turns around and looks at me and just both arms up in the air and just screams, Whoa! I couldn't believe it. You know, I couldn't it, believe it. It's none of that quiet, shh. Yeah. Oh, no. Not a good buck. Blah, 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 blah. No, he was like, Whoa! There was no whispering. They heard me from Kansas to, to Montana. It was crazy. I couldn't believe that we actually we were able to do that because yeah. when we watched him go in bed down and he we know he had a, a doe with him. And a spike. And a spike. Or a forky, I'm sorry. And we yeah. sat and we waited and we waited and we waited and then finally, It took over five hours for that hunt, but on camera, you know, it's like, yeah, it's again, it's a couple minutes. Yeah. Right. But, uh, you know, yeah. we watched him and we lost him. And then and we then, did find our boots. Yep, we he did. You made me take my boots off and walk in cactus. Yep. You got, you yelled at me for that one too. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, to, to all of a sudden we were pretty much leaving. I mean, we didn't want to bump him. So we circled all the way around with the wind and we said, you know, let's just get out. And we just looked way to the North and I'm like, there he is. And he, he walked straight. He was walking straight East turned and went West. And I'm like, Vicky, I, I mean, just because, you know, be, being around, a lot of wildlife, you know, I sort of, I said, he's looking to bed. He's looking to bed. And sure enough, we, we sat down. We gave him another about an hour to start just chewing his cud and just to relax. The only thing that was real nervous, you know, we didn't know where that doe and the forky were. We did not see them at all. 
Um, so then we walked down the, the, the ditch, came up this other point, and Vicky's the one that actually spotted the tines. Yeah, you could just see his antlers just, just, he, moved. just moved it. And actually, when we first saw him, he actually, he was laying with his head on the ground. And you could just see the tips of it over the sage and the um, the dead sunflowers that were out there, the dead wildflowers that were out there. Yep. Because actually, then when we went and we recovered him, yep. his chin was all... Uh, his chin and his his legs, his, I don't know from, from knees, laying, but yep. from laying down and that and that rough stuff was all beat up from it. It was just awesome. No kidding! Wow, two fantastic stories, two yeah. fantastic deer. Great, great, great detail. Love it. So we like to do this thing called the ten rapid fire questions to yeah, okay. kind of finish up the show, and I'll bounce back and forth between the two of you. you. Can give me your straightforward, honest answer. It's not not complicated. We'll just. Run through them if you're ready. No, hang on one second. Okay. Ralph, just close my window. Hang on, hang on. Sorry, there's a dog barking. A dog. Out. Yeah, I could, trying to make a bark. I've been I've been hearing the uh, birds tweeting. Um, yeah, there, well, my well window's done. open. So nice outside, and there's a cardinal that like yes. flying my window. <clears throat> yes. So he's just out there singing. He hasn't flown into the window it. during the. So it's it's right. good. Yep. Yeah, it's been quite quite enjoyable. Sounds like I'm outside talking to you. So yeah, he's pretty... he's out there in the bar, in my in the bushes outside my window. There he goes. There he again. is. Yep, there he is right there. Yep. yep. Very funny. We wanted to bring you the the, the whole atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. It's the whole package. It's the whole, the package. whole package. Ralph and Vicky, the whole package. Yep. It's the experience. I would rather listen to him singing rather than running into my window. Right. So I'll take the singing. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like a Disney ride. They give you the full it is. It, it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, rapid question. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh let's start with, with Vicky. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? My number one hunting tip of all time? Yep. Um, my number one hunting tip, let's see quickly, honestly, is to be as scent free as possible and enjoy every minute in God's creation. I like it. I like it. Yeah. All right, Ralph, what do you say? Yeah, I would say living. You, you, li- no, you oh. can't copy mine. Oh, okay. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Food, cover, water. Food. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, now and then, and some hunters have these, some don't, but now and then, if you leave it in your truck, it drives you crazy that you don't have it on your hunt. What's that one thing for you? Start with Ralph. Toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, you said first thing comes to my mind. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I freaking knew I left the toilet paper in the truck and didn't throw it in my pack. Oh, right. my gosh. Is that the truth, though? <laughs> Come on. Oh my gosh! Vicky. I, I, I can honestly tell you, I've never left, and I don't. I'm gonna jinx myself. Yep. I've never left my binos or my rangefinder. I've always, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's it's like a just a thing, and maybe it's a. I left my bow once at the hotel. Yeah, you did. I did that one. You really did. That was really dumb. But like he was asking, you know, what do you normally leave it like in the truck, right? That that but, you wish you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I usually have everything in my backpack. I don't carry anything separate, so I just take my pack and my bow and I head out. It's all so there. I don't know. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> some people don't have them, but it, 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 we've had some interesting answers for that question over the years. It's kind of funny. All right, very good. Huh. Yeah. If toilet you th- paper. If you think of something, Vicky, we'll just leave it at toilet paper. Okay, <laughs> just, just leave it at toilet paper. Right. That's fine. All right. Yeah, or I should just say Ralph toilet paper because yeah. I Ralph. would have to bring it from him because he would forget it. So. Right, right. <laughs> What's your, uh, start with, uh, Vicky, Vicky, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Oh, my biggest pet peeve in life. Okay. So let's see what, what drives me the most crazy thing besides the Cardinal that runs into my window all the last three weeks. Um, my biggest pet peeve, you know, you're asking some crazy questions. Yep. Why is that? Um, I know, right. My biggest pet peeve. Um, you know what? I honestly, this is going to sound kind of crazy. Is my biggest pet peeve is, is just grumpy people mm-hmm. in general. Yep. Like, honestly, life is so short that when someone comes in and they have an attitude, if someone comes to work and they have an attitude, or if you're at a show and people just got attitudes, I think, you know what, count your blessings every day, enjoy it. Nice. It, it does drive me kind of crazy, you know, I, I really is. I wouldn't say, you know, Ralph wearing muddy boots in the house, because that's a pet peeve, but he's really good at not doing it too often, so I can't really throw that one out there. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you, though. I mean, that, that's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, it, it is. It, it's one of those things where it's like, you know what, life is meant to be happy. You should be joyful. Yes, you're going to have bad times, but count your blessings and move on. Right. That's a good one. All right, Ralph, how about you? People trying to be something they're not. Excellent. All right. Now, I, I shared my age with both of you earlier, what, and I'm trying to get a bearing on it sounds like you're in my age group. Um, 
So yeah, I'm 57. 57. Okay, very good. And I'm between the two of you. No, actually, I just I turned, <laughs> I turned 50 last year. 50. Okay. All right. Yeah. So understanding that, looking back, uh, what would you tell the 25 year old, knowing what you know today? Mm, that are wanting to do what we're doing, or just yeah. in general, 25 just, year old. Just in general, like just what would you sit down and say? That this is what you need to know because I figured it out along the way. Listen to everything that your parents told you when you were younger because they were right. Wow, that's a good one. That's a big one. Yeah. Huh, Ralph? I'm going to tell you, don't live by the saying, that was then, this is now. No. Right. Because if you really just open your mind up and listen to your to your parents and people that you trust and have faith in, you, you can save yourself a hell of a lot of heartache um, and, and, you know, swallow your pride at 25. If you can do that, you are going to be so tremendously successful. And it's not just financially. Man, it's spiritually, it's everything. If you can truly understand that, you know, that, that the life you lead is a circle of someone else too, and someone's been there and done it. Yep. And if you, if you open up to, to, to being able to just listen, oh my gosh. Right. Good one. All right. Number five, you meet a stranger at a hotel lobby at some hunting convention somewhere in the world, and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? <laughs> okay. It's at a hunting convention? Yeah. Um, well, we own a production company, Archer's Choice Media, and we have two television shows, Archer's Choice and The Choice on the Outdoor Channel. So basically, that's what we do. Okay. Ralph, We're in I... the airport. We say we have a production company. <laughs> production company. Keep it simple, right? <laughs> Keep it simple. If they go into it further, then you can divulge into it a little bit further, you know, but sometimes gotcha. you're not sure you're going to run into. Gotcha. Ralph, same answer? Uh, pretty much, you know, you, you know, because you never, you, you don't want to have any heartache with conflicts with people yep but you know one of the things that I, I love telling them is i said well we live the outdoor lifestyle gotcha very nice all right this is an easy one what did you have for breakfast this morning um i had a vanilla protein shake with spinach, spinach strawberries berries. bananas and blueberries same here wow healthy and a cup of coffee or three i was no, gonna I, say I, I thought you had i thought you were a big coffee drinker based oh, off of i i also had I did not pass on the coffee, but we've been doing protein shakes in the morning okay. lately. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm all for the protein shakes, but the coffee's got to be mixed in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. No, it's co yeah. actually, it's coffee, then the protein shake, and then, then coffee, coffee and again. coffee. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, only, I'm a one-cup guy. You're a one-cup kind of guy. Got it. I'm oh, yeah. the let me finish off the pot for you. Right, right. <laughs> are, you guys, are you guys hooked up with Hunter's Blend? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, calling them guys. Yep, those guys are good guys. Yeah, we're we we got hooked up with them as well. It's good coffee. Yeah, the coffee is really good. And actually, Ralph could tell the difference, believe it or not. Oh so, yeah. And he's not a coffee connoisseur. And Paul's a great guy. Um, yeah. In fact, I last time I emailed him, I said, "Hey, you'll be proud of me because I've always used all the flavored creamers and everything like that. And I've gotten away from flavored creamer now. I'm just putting a little bit of milk in there and a little bit of a." Uh, like a stevia, like a little sugar in there, and that's it. He's like, I'm so proud of you, Vic. <laughs> right, that is good. I'm I'm a straight up black coffee. That's yep. may, maybe a, if I'm feeling a, a little frisky, I'll, I'll I'll put in a little dash of cinnamon. Ooh, but that's it. There you go. All right, let me be clear out. Let me just throw it out there. I drink coffee so people think I'm an adult. Yeah, and he puts <laughs> like half a oh, yeah. of vanilla. <laughs> that's the only reason. <laughs> He actually adds a little coffee to his creamer. Yeah, that's that me. That's funny. <laughs> okay, all right, good to know. Instead of smoking cigars. Exactly. That's it. Right. Nice. Uh, okay, this one, you you get your own billboard. It's a blank canvas on the side of a highway, wherever you want to put it. What would it say? Um, when in doubt, look up. Nice. Ralph? Yeah. In God we trust. Excellent. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Who's person that pops in your head when you say success. Wow. I know I'm going to piss people off right here, but I, I will tell you that just came came to my head. Ooh. Trump. Right. Yeah, successful. You're I'm right. being honest. No. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and maybe because he's in the media as much as he is, he's our president, he, you know, our leader, but, but, but yeah, I, I mean, then if I think about it, you know, that there, there's many that, you know, we've come across yep. that have been very, that are very successful. Yep. But, but I would... He asked our first thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's, he's on the, I had the same answer because he's on the four foremost thoughts of many people, right? Because he's the president. Hey, and hey. he set out an incredibly difficult goal that oh. that seemingly was impossible. Right, and right. he did it. I mean. It's Absolutely, not, and he's still fighting tooth and nail every right, day. Right, right. He's 
still there, and you still have all this fake news and everything else. And honestly, Ralph, I think I think I would have to agree with Ralph on that one yeah. because I mean, like yeah, him, because, like him or he, not, whatever whatever your opinion is, it's still he's still successful. He he set an incredibly difficult goal and six and succeeded. Yeah, and and look at what he's done. Right. Look at unemployment. Look at look at I mean Hispanic. Look at North Korea. I mean look at all these things that he he, he you know more people working than ever. Uh, I mean, just there, there's a whole lot of things, and you know we're not tooting anyone's horn, but, no, but right. the reality of it is, is it, our fir- my first thought, and I think Vicky just said it too, is would be Trump, and you did too, right? Yeah, I came to the same conclusion. It's hard not to, really. Yeah. 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 Okay, what's a typical day in your life look like? Oh, uh, let's see. Wake up because our dog. We have a yellow lab. His name is Boomer. He's, you might have heard him snoring in bed. He, he's an English lab. He is <laughs> 150 pounds, and he's got a head. It would be. It would. Measure- it's open young. It, or maybe I measured him a little he, over 18 inches. He's, he's a big yellow lab, and he seems to think that hunting season or no hunting season, that Ralph or I should be up at 4 a.m. every morning. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. Which... So one of us get up at 4 a.m. with him, depending on the day we're sleeping at or whoever said he's, he's growling, you know, like pushing us around on. Um, and then, let's see. So I get up, start my coffee, let the dogs out, mm-hmm. yep. have coffee, make a shake, Pack RJ's lunch. Our son RJ is a junior in high school, and okay. he still takes lunch every day to school, so I have to make his lunch. Sure. Um, and go straight to work, which our office is right by where we live, so yeah. we don't really have a long commute. Work, most, so most, most of the guys and everybody in, in, in are here, by eight, are here at 8, 8, at 8 o'clock, and then we're in the office till 5. Yep. And then dinner, and actually, like today, it's a track meet. we got to go to track meet. we got to leave here at 4 for a track meet today. So, And then um, usually go in, make dinner. Clean up dinner, shoot our bows a little bit, maybe go hike through the woods, get a little exercise going in on there, huh, Ralph? Yep. And then uh, kind of relax. It's usually like Showers. 9 o'clock by that time. And <laughs> go back to the crap. Bed. Now, now, if it's hunting season, it's a different story. Well, hunting season. The next, up, that, that's the next days. question, actually. What's, your, what's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? There you go. Um, up early. Up um, really early. Yep, real early. Still Showers. Make coffee. Vicky's guaranteed coffee. Make it um, coffee to go. And it all depends where we're at. Uh, you know, if, if it's if it's in the wilderness, a lot of times we're just going through our packs, making sure we got everything to start packing out, you know, packing in. So um, if we're on a boat hunt, you're going through, you're checking some of the boat stuff, making sure all that's done. Um, so, so each different hunt is different that way, but um, it, it's hunting. And then hopefully midday, sort of taking a break, relaxing. If you can, either it's on a mountain or somewhere, or getting back to camp. Sort of relaxing a little bit, camaraderie. Get hit, hit it for the afternoon. Come back, have some eat, shower, and then call it quits. Very cool, awesome. Those are the ten rapid fire questions, guys. You did great. Wasn't, wasn't too bad, help. right? Not too bad. Not too bad. All right. So if we've created more questions than answers in the last hour, um, where can we go to find more information, watch your videos, get your online content, that kind of stuff? It's actually really easy. You can go to archerschoice.com. We have our website right there. We have some content on it. And then actually all of our social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, it's whatever it is, say facebook.com slash Ralph and Vicky. Spell it out, Ralph, R-A-L-P-H-A-N-D-V-I-C-K-I. And it goes to all of our different things. But you can get to all of our social medias through our website as well. So it's really easy to find us. Beautiful. Excellent. Well, guys, I, I got to say, I've really enjoyed talking to you. You're, you. You make me laugh. You have good, positive energy. And I still can't believe that it's 500 shows and 30 years oh. and that, that you work together as a couple is insane and just well done. Well, thank, thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. We're, um, we're trying to put, away, put something together for that 500 episode. So everyone will have to keep trying to. 500? 500. 500. Just, yeah, you said too. I was looking at the number five written down okay. on my desk. <laughs> Oops. You know, this is why we still get along, I guess, because we just torment each other. That's it. That's <laughs> it. That's part of it, right? So yes. cool. Excellent. Well, thanks, thanks for stepping into Big Buck Studios. Hey, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Thanks to Ralph and Vicki for sharing their background with us. It was pretty interesting to hear how everything got started with just a small archer shop and uh, grew into a bigger one and then eventually got into media and 400 episodes later here they are probably one of the most recognized brands and and couples and people in the hunting industry so there you have it 
do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? Yeah, we do, Jay, and I, I hear this a lot. That The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. People talk about food plots and and they they get discouraged by them and and it's it's real simple and I'm gonna kind of break this down in in a fashion that somebody can understand a little bit better and be able to do this and be successful with what they're doing. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, you need a big tractor and a, a three point tiller and and you need to go out there with this tractor and make food plots. Well, you know the truth is. Is that as long as you got uh, sunlight getting to the ground and you got a garden tiller and you got a piece of chain link fence and maybe a four wheeler to drag it, uh, you can go out there with your garden tiller, haul it out to the woods, back of your truck, unload that thing on your small trailer, whatever you can haul it on, unload that garden tiller and, and, and spend two or three hours with the garden tiller working up through maybe a four wheeler trail or back in a corner where the grass is maybe a little bit taller and you know uh, where the farmer cannot plant and maybe it's the edge of the field or or you know in the deep timber as long as you can get that sunlight down to that seed bed it'll germinate and produce a food plot but if you can go in there and you can till up a five foot wide 100 200 foot long strip you're you you've got yourself a miniature food plot and a food source come them late late winter months that just might give you that success rate so you go in there you till it up maybe you spray it first you till it up and then you take and spread your seed and then if you take a chain link fence and i've actually got a really small piece that i can drag by hand behind me it's got a two by four on the front of it and it's got it's about six foot wide and it's got a, about a six foot piece of chain link fence hooked to it on a on a piece of paracord that i can actually physically drag myself through the woods so you know food plots are not all about big expensive equipment uh, you can do it on a smaller scale with a garden tiller and a and a hand spreader and a uh, piece of chain link fence to kind of roll the dirt back over the seed. And it's pretty simple. So just keep that in mind that you don't necessarily need that big monstrous piece of equipment to do a food plot. You can do it with smaller equipment. It takes a little more time, a little more effort. But if you're willing to put in the effort, you'll reap the reward. Hmm. That's a cool idea. I didn't really think about getting a little garden tiller out there and a little chain link. I mean, it doesn't take much really to put that stuff together, does it? No, it sure doesn't. And it's just another way to, to take your hunt to the next level mm-hmm. by having that, that small food plot. And, you know, you may not see activity on it right away, but I'm sure once the winter months set in and they're starting to get desperate for a food source, it may just give you that uh, 25, 30-yard broadside shot on that buck you've been chasing all year. When would you plant that stuff? Like what time of year right now, or would you wait a little bit? There's different seed varieties. Uh, you know, obviously right now is more of the grass, the clovers, the alfalfa, the the rye grass, uh, whatever type of grasses you're wanting to plant. Right now is the time. Uh, you know, obviously if you got a large uh, growth of undergrowth weeds, and, and if you go into the woods, and something I'll touch base with a little bit here, you go in the woods and you see that grass is established and you're seeing quite a bit of grass undergrowth in the woods and, and you're seeing that the grass is knee high by now in most places. Well, that, that means that there's sunlight getting down to that soil. And uh, if there wasn't no sun, there wouldn't be no grass. So just take that in mind. If you if you walk in the woods and it's bare and it's number of trees and leaves and moss and it's all just bare ground, there's no greenery growing there. The odds are there's not enough sunlight to germinate a food plot seed. So keep that in mind. If you go in, you find you a good four-wheeler trail that's got tall grass on it, and you can get in there and spray it. Mm-hmm. And if you just go to your local co-op or tractor supply or tractor, you know, a farm ag store, and you, you buy yourself some Roundup, you know, all the instructions on the label, uh, you know, a gallon of generic Roundup, which is like a buccaneer, a Buccaneer Plus is generic Roundup. It's usually around 45 bucks for two and a half gallons. You mix it up uh, uh, an ounce per gallon. You put it in a backpack sprayer or a small hand pump sprayer. You go in, you spray the weeds, give it three or four weeks, let them weeds die off, and then you're able to get in there with your tiller and just go ahead and work that dead uh, grass or weeds right into the ground. And, 
And, uh, you know, triple 12 fertilized will mostly cover any kind of food plot that you're going to put down. Um, you know, obviously a soil sample would be the way to go, but if you're just doing something small and you can pick it up a bag of pelletized lime or powder lime and just sprinkle lime over it, uh, just to neutralize that pH a little bit and, or raise it a little bit and get it where it, the acid's neutralized in the soil and, and, um, you know, most alfalfa, orchard grass, any kind of timothy or rye or whatever kind of grass you're going to plant or clover, it's all pretty much you can broadcast spread it. Uh, you know, you don't want to saturate the ground with seed, but put a, quite a bit of, you know, it's, let's say I'm doing a 100 foot by 5 foot. I'd go in there with probably, I'm guessing, 20 pound of seed and spread it and uh, lay it down pretty thick. And once it starts growing, you'll see the deer start to uh trim that off and if it gets real big and you think man that, that looks really mature you can go in there with the weed whacker and just trim it up and let that new growth come on and it really provides some great nutritional value for your for your white-tailed deer throughout the the warmer months but uh if you're looking for something more in the winter months uh get yourself some uh some seed that's got uh you know winter radishes and and turnips and get get that in the ground and, and get you some winter some winter tonnage growing. Gotcha. Very nice, man. That's it's got me thinking of it from different spots that I think I want to try. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, Facebook.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry. We're also on Twitter, which is Twitter.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry. We are also on Instagram, Instagram.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash big buck registry on YouTube. You can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there. So you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them. And we've gone back and interviewed re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice. Let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week.